Hi, I'm Akshun Shaurya Dogra, a researcher with interests in dynamical systems and information theory with my friend William D. Redman, who is a researcher in dynamical neuroscience. I'm pleased to present our work on optimizing neural networks via Koopman operator theory. This presentation is focused on giving everyone a brief and practically minded introduction to why we believe that dynamical systems theory has powerful tools to offer the field of neural network optimization. Indeed, by the end of this presentation, we hope that you might even agree that the scope could extend to all computing systems that leverage iterative optimization algorithms. Before we begin on that path, you might ask, why are we interested in it? Well, efficient optimization is a problem of broad interest. Machine learning has become increasingly pers pervasive in almost all scientific disciplines. Techniques that lower the computational costs associated with its implementation have great potential for positive impacts throughout the scientific world. Unfortunately, optimization, especially in the context of deep neural networks, is a highly non-convex, non-linear problem. Fortunately for us, we can view it from a dynamical systems perspective. In this, in this presentation, we will show why that is a particularly lucrative option. In particular, we will show that Koopman operator theory has powerful tools that should be of strong interest. This presentation is structured as follows. First, I will demonstrate why neural network training and Koopman operator theory are intimately connected and how we can leverage this connection to accelerate optimization without significant losses in accuracy. Then William will discuss the results of our attempts to leverage such connections. In particular, he will show that our methods can be successful across different choices of objectives, optimizers, activation functions, and architecture sizes. We will end our presentation with a discussion on the major open questions we identified. Before we move forward, we would like to put out a disclaimer saying that a lot of things discussed here are based on heuristical and in informal arguments. So let us begin by discussing why neural network optimization and Koopman operator theory might be connected. Right off the bat, we have to realize that iterative optimization is a discrete dynamical system. Using different kinds of optimizers and objective functions, we refine parameters, let's say the weights and biases of a neural network, so that they are fit for some given task at hand. Each training iteration, we test the fitness of existing parameter values for that task at hand. And then based on some rule, usually derived by our understanding of the system, we refine those parameter values so that they are better suited for our objectives. By viewing the number of training iterations as a kind of a temporal parameter, it is obvious that iterative optimization constitutes a discrete dynamical flow in the parameter space, which is governed by the optimization algorithm at hand, let's say gradient descent. Hence, optimization of neural networks can be in particular viewed as a discrete dynamical system with the weights and biases acting as the state space variables. Remember, this picture is not that unfamiliar. Whenever we are introduced to concepts like backpropagation or gradient descent in very introductory machine learning courses, we are usually asked to view the optimization as looking for some local minimas in the loss landscape. Therefore, we can see the optimization of neural networks as a process where we randomly initialize ourselves somewhere in the space of weights and biases and then follow our trajectory to some adequate local minima. In the dynamical systems perspective, this local minima can be viewed as a fixed point for a dynamical system with the region around it serving as some sort of a basin of attraction for that local minima or fixed point. In many ways, this state space picture can be considered the default perspective on dynamical systems theory. Koopman operator theory takes a different view of the system. It focuses not on the state space parameters of the system, let's say the location of a thrown ball in time, but on the state space function or observables of the system, let's say the kinetic energy of that thrown ball. Under very reasonable assumptions, this alternative perspective is as powerful and complete as the state space picture. The Koopman operator is the centerpiece of this perspective. 
it lifts our perspective to the observable space and governs the dynamics there. By its very construction, it also confers the advantage of being a linear operator. This can be tested very easily by yourself. This lift can be extremely powerful, especially if the associated state space is a very nonlinear one. Koopman operator theory opens access to linear tools, even when the underlying data comes from some nonlinear setting. Finally, the two perspectives can be connected by a very simple realization. The identity observable, the object that maps state space variables to state space variables, is within the ambit of the Koopman operator. Through the identity observable, Koopman operator theory inspired techniques can be used to analyze the state dynamics themselves. Unfortunately, Koopman operators are usually infinite dimensional and impossible to construct analytically. While this had been a serious impediment to the use of KOT for many decades, recent advances in data-driven methods have transformed it into a ready-made practical tool for many different kinds of settings. Our hypothesis was that neural network optimization, especially the latter half, could be one of them. In particular, we wanted to investigate if simple tools from Koopman operator theory could be used to forecast weight and bias dynamics. We chose the finite section method for this task, which produces a finite dimensional matrix approximation of the Koopman operator. Here is a brief look into how the finite section method could allow us to forecast the weight and bias dynamics. We begin by initializing a neural network at some random weight and bias values. We assume that the network is using some iterative optimization algorithm, let us say Ada Delta, to train itself. We start collecting information regarding the weight and bias trajectories after a certain amount of training has finished and stop collecting the data when we ascertain that Koopman training could accurately forecast the evolution of weight and bias values from there on. We construct the approximation to the Koopman operator and then use it to push the weight and bias evolution forward. Repeated application of the approximation allows us to do this. Before we move on to the results, let us take the time to understand what we are hoping to achieve here. The hypothesis is that neural network weights and biases are evolving along a trajectory with the goal of reaching some fixed point in the loss landscape. The computational burden associated with this optimization usually comes from the optimizer being used, say Adam or Ada Delta. Roughly speaking, let us assume a neural network has n layers, each with n activations, giving us a total of n cubed weights and biases that are iteratively and collectively moved towards values that end up minimizing the loss or cost function being used. The per iteration complexity of optimizing such a neural network using standard optimizers is usually of order j n cubed, where j is the batch size associated with the optimization. There is some Koopman operator associated with this evolution that is fully capable of driving these dynamics without needing to involve the chosen optimizer at all. The entire process of backpropagation can be completely sidestepped. Unfortunately, driving the evolution via the true Koopman operator would be impractical for a dynamical system as complicated as a deep neural network. That is, even if it was possible in the first place. For that reason, the first goal of our work was to simply investigate if a finite rank approximation built using the weight and loss trajectory data at hand could adequately drive the weight and bias dynamics for some non-trivial number of training iterations. A priori, this seemed impractical during the initial phases of training, where the weight evolution is especially sensitive. This situation is made worse if stochasticity is involved. However, as the neural network starts getting optimized, the weights and biases enter regions of local minima. In the dynamical system perspective, think basins of attractions or fixed points. The intuition was that the weight and bias dynamics would be relatively simpler and that in those regions, the system may be reasonably assumed to be structurally stable. In particular, we draw parallels with classical results in dynamical systems theory, like the hartman grobman theorem, which implies that linearization is effective in the neighborhoods of hyperbolic fixed points, even if the full system is highly nonlinear. 
Thus, we believed that if our finite approximation based Koopman training was used close enough to the fixed points or local minimas, it could reliably drive the weight and bias dynamics thereon, thus making a clear and practical demonstration that KOT or Koopman operator theory can be used to study the weight and bias dynamics of a deep neural network, even if that is only possible in limited circumstances. The secondary motivation was evaluating the threshold at which Koopman training would become a practical alternative to standard optimizers. Clearly, constructing a single n cubed by n cubed dimensional matrix to drive the evolution forward would be too, too expensive in comparison to the standard optimizers like Adam or Eta Delta. Remember, their complexity is roughly j n cubed, where j is the batch size. A n cubed by n cubed matrix driving a n cubed dimensional vector forward would cost substantially more. Hence, there was a real need to identify the levels at which weight and bias dynamics should be studied. In effect, in, in effect we would need to study them in mutually exclusive subsets. Each subset's dynamics would be considered independent of the others and evolved separately. We realized and proved that finite section method would be extremely efficient if the weight and bias dynamics were studied at the single weight or node level. In effect, we were partitioning the larger dimensional full network dynamics into smaller sub dynamics. The assumption that Koopman training was turned on when the system had entered a regime with structural stability would ensure that there existed some neighborhood around these minimas such that this decomposition into smaller parts could be done without an inordinate drop in performance or accuracy. We focused on investigating the weight and bias dynamics during the latter halves of optimization. In a certain sense, the aim was to rebalance the loss performance versus computational cost ratios during the latter half of training. In many deep neural networks, the regions of local minimas are found early on, and the optimizer spends most of the later resources simply refining the solution. In the dynamical sense, we can say that the weights and biases find basins of attractions relatively early in the training, and then the optimizer spends a significant portion of the resources on trying to get as close to the fixed point as possible. To understand the results presented hereafter, we just need to keep three things in our mind. Neural network training can be viewed as a discrete dynamical system. This dynamical system admits a natural Koopman interpretation at least in certain specific circumstances. The dynamical system associated with the entire network's weights and biases can be partitioned into smaller subsystems and still be studied accurately. Now that Action has gone over neural network training and Koopman operator theory and how we went about building and implementing Koopman training, I can get into our results. So in this initial work, we focused completely on feed forward fully connected neural networks. And we felt like this was a good starting point for validating and sort of understanding Koopman training because uh, we thought it was these, these networks would have easy enough and simple enough dynamics that we could actually feasibly learn them using Koopman operator theory, but they were still a type of network that people would be interested in and, and, and it's a type of network that people actually use in um, whatever applications they're interested in. And in particular, we focus on the Hamiltonian neural network, which Action was involved in analyzing, uh, whose architecture is shown here on the screen. And uh, as the name suggests, it's a type of neural network that is used to solve dynamical systems that satisfy Hamilton's equations. Um, now, uh, there's sort of two key points to, to, uh, before I go any further. So the first thing is we also uh, tried Koopman training on another neural network that uh, was also feed forward and fully connected, but had a different architecture, had different activation functions, and had a different objective in particular. It was trained on the MNIST data set, so a, a sort of very different task. And uh, we had similar results, and I'll discuss some of those results uh, as we go on. And the, the other key point to take away is that neither the MNIST network nor the Hamiltonian neural network um, a priori should have any reason to be better suited for Koopman training than any other feed-forward fully ne connected ne neural network. So hopefully we can convince you that this is a, a general approach and it's not something that only uh, works well on the examples that we looked at. Now, as Akshan sort of discussed, 
earlier, we implemented no recoupment training, and this is because we had those runtime complexity calculations that Action talked about, which made it seem like no recoupment training, at least in certain cases, could be faster than the standard training approaches, but we should be able to capture the rich dynamics that are happening in the full weight, uh, weight bias um, trajectories. Now, to give you a timeline of our experiments, at T0, we started Eta Delta training, um, and for the Hamiltonian neural network, we tried a few different optimizers, Eta Delta, Adam, and Eta Grad. Um, for the MNIST network, we just use Eta Delta, and I'm just going to be showing the Eta Delta results, but they're all relatively similar. And of course, if you were to try this, you know, yourself, you could use any optimizer, any sort of standard optimizer. Um, but at T0, we started our standard optimizer, and uh, at T1, we started recording the weights and biases of every uh, every unit in the network. And uh, we continued to save uh, these weights and biases up until T2. Now T2, we stopped recording and we made a copy of the network. So now we have two networks. Um, and on one of them, we built the node Koopman operators and started Koopman training, uh, which we did capital T time steps. And on the other copy of the network, we continued the standard uh, training just like we had been doing. And we also evolved it for capital T time steps. And after having done both of these things, we, we stopped and compared the two networks. Now, um, something that any new optimizer has to be good at in order to be at all practical is to improve the loss performance of the neural network. So the first thing we did was we compared the loss performance of the sort of standard trained network uh, using, in this case, Eta Delta, against the Koopman trade network. And here's an example where you can see that there's almost a complete overlap for 2,500 time steps. Um, so that is that the loss of the Koopman train network is almost identical to that of the Eta Delta train network. So it's like Koopman training, you know, is completely the same from, from the loss perspective. Now, this is just one example, and we wanted to quantify this for a number of different random, randomly initialized um, starting points in the network. And so to do this, we uh, developed this sort of metric called T equivalent, which looked at how many uh, Eta Delta training steps did you need to get to the same loss as Koopman training. So if uh, T equivalent was greater than zero, this meant that uh, applying Koopman training lowered the loss um, from the, the lowered the loss of the network work from where it started. And we call this a successful case. So at least Koopman training wasn't making anything worse. And uh, of course, the closer the ratio T equivalent by T is to one, the closer um, Koopman training approximates eta delta in terms of the loss. So a single Koopman training step has roughly the same uh, action on the loss as eta delta. And you can see that the ratio of T equivalent to T is, was right around one, and there's only one network where this ratio wasn't right around there, and we were 100% successful. So this was very encouraging and sort of led us believe that maybe Koopman training could be feasibly used in, a, in some sort of practical settings. Now, uh, you might be wondering, well, what about the, the weights and the biases? Because all the theory that Action had developed in the previous slides were about weights and biases. Now, obviously, the loss is a function of weights and biases, so the fact that we were doing a, a good job um, predicting the loss and the Koopman training network was matching the loss of the standard training network were, were all good signs, but you know, there could, be, there could be reasons to think that maybe the more dynamic weights and biases, maybe we weren't doing a good job. And if, if that was the case, then that sort of puts a very specific lifetime on how long Koopman training could be practical. So to get at this, we looked at individual weights and how well Koopman training matched the weight trajectories of yeah, the Eta Delta network. So in this example, you can see that, again, like with the loss, there's almost complete overlap over the relevant amount of training time between the Eta Delta trained neural network and the um, Koopman trained neural network. Now, to sort of uh, anticipate a point, which is a very good point, which is that in these Eta Delta plots that I'm showing, it's practically like we've got uh, straight lines, that the weights are going in these straight lines. And so um, is it any less impressive that Koopman training is able to accurately predict these these weights uh, evolutions. Now, there are two points. So first, um, it's not, it, well, it is no, no less impressive because Koopman training, um, it's not like Koopman training is fitting lines to these things. It's actually learning the underlying dynamics, whatever those might be. And the second point 
and sort of the jump ahead of myself is that Kuhlman training continues to be successful even when the weight and bias dynamics aren't just straight lines. And you can see this very clearly in the MNIST network where the weights uh, had some more stochasticity in them and that had to do with how we were training the neural networks. And, and you can see that Koopman training, even in this case, is again, very good at discovering the underlying trends of the weights. So again, these are just some examples, but we wanted to know how good were we at uh, predicting the weights and biases across all the networks that we looked at with all the different random initializations. So to do that, we plotted the uh, sort of error or the difference between our sort of predicted values and the true values, uh, the true values being coming from the eta delta network um, as a function of how much the true weights and biases evolved. So the farther the points are from the center, of the x-axis, the more dynamic they are, and the farther the points are from the center of the y-axis, the worse we did. So if uh, you might imagine that if the most dynamic weights were the ones that we did the worst at predicting, um, you know, there might be some sort of linear relationship or quadratic or something like that. But instead we see that even the very dynamic weights are being well tracked. And in fact, it is the sort of least dynamic weights uh, that we sometimes had a little bit of trouble with. But in general, we found that our error was about two orders of magnitude smaller than the amount that the weights evolved over the, the interval of training time that Koopman training was applied to. So this is very encouraging and in general um, made us believe that uh, Koopman training was doing a good job at pre predicting the weights and biases and that this was leading to equivalent loss performance. So finally, as action motivated at the very beginning, the whole reason we looked at Koopman training was because we thought it might be faster. And indeed, you can see that in this case, um, we were 140 times faster over the relevant amount of training time than A to Delta. So um, uh, this sort of suggests that indeed, as the theory suggested, Koopman training uh, was, was not only able to accurately predict, the loss uh, and weight dynamics, but also uh, could do it at a much faster uh, speed. And this happened to be true for the two other optimizers that we looked at for this network. Um, an important point to note here is that uh, different optimizers induce different dynamics on the weight and bias trajectories. So um, it's not at all trivial that just because we, did a, we were successful for eta delta, that doesn't um, sort of necessarily mean that we would have to be successful for Adam or Adegrad. And there are obviously reasons that people are interested in using those optimizers. So uh, it, we were relieved to see that we were able to be successful in all three cases, although the success was slightly different um, and as was a speed up. Uh, and then finally, uh, like I talked about earlier, we were interested in making sure that Koopman training was, uh, could work beyond just this example of a neural network differential equation solver. So we tried it on a, um, a network that was trained on the MNIST data set, which was much larger and had much, uh, had different activation functions and a completely different objective. And again, we found that um, we, were, we could be very successful and that we had a, a 15 times speed up. So again, we were f much faster than the standard optimizer. So finally, and sort of to summarize, in practice, Koopman training was able to successfully uh, track and predict the true weight and bias evolution that a given optimizer induced. And this good predicting led to a uh, very similar uh, loss performance of the Koopman training network versus the standard optimi standardly optimized neural network. And uh, this was done all done while being considerably faster. In conclusion, we think that Koopman training uh, it seems like a very viable and practical tool that can be implement, could be implemented um, in the future. So uh, as is probably very clear from our presentation, uh, while we think this is a very exciting area, there's still certainly a bunch of um, unanswered questions. And I think our, our work has opened a number of questions that we didn't address here or in the paper. Um, and so we'd like to sort of end by discussing some of those, which we hope maybe some people who are viewing this uh, will, will be interested in tackling. So before I get to those, I just want to 
emphasize that this is a developing subfield. So shortly after our paper came on archive, there were two other groups that had sort of independently come to similar conclusions. Um, one with uh, from a, a group here at UCSB that uh, was is led by Igor Mezik among, among others, and then another group um, down in Texas that uh, again both of these papers had similar themes to ours. So if this is something you're interested in, I'd say definitely check the these two papers out because I think they give a more complete picture of what Koopman operator theory has to offer to the study of neural networks. And also, uh, even though we share a lot of similar themes, they definitely had different perspectives than we did. So um, definitely worth uh, looking into if you're interested. Now, uh, one of the important open questions that we didn't address and in, indeed was sort of a limitation of the, our study was that we don't know when to turn on Koopman training. So we don't know what T1 should be optimally. Um, and we don't know what T2 should be, which is you know, the period of time where you stop collecting data. And um, this, any sort of future well-optimized uh, usage of Koopman training will, should have some sort of method of adaptively figuring that out. Now here, interestingly, we believe Koopman operator theory could come in handy because a very robust indicator of when you're in uh, in the basin of attraction of a fixed point, which as Akshan said was sort of key, uh, key assumption to being able to patch or split apart the full Koopman operator, is that you, uh, the eigenvalues of the Koopman operator all lie along the unit circle. Um, so you could imagine having some sort of small Koopman operator that you're keeping track of uh, and using small amount of data as you're training the neural network and when a lot of its eigenvalues are along the unit circle, bam, it's time to start actually saving all the weights so you can do Koopman training. But that, this is just an idea. Um, and regardless, it's something that we need to address. Um, now, as I actually mentioned, the patching argument is it was really essential to us being able to uh, be faster than the standard optimizers. But at the moment, it was a little hand wavy and we'd really like to get our argument on more solid ground. And then finally, there's a number of other speed ups that um, we didn't implement in this uh, in this paper, but uh, could definitely increase our advantage over the standard optimizer. So one of those is parallelization. So Koopman training is even better suited for um, parallelization than standard methods because it involves a lot of matrix operations, many of which are non-sequential. And so you could, you could easily split those on different cores. And lastly, there exist some other methods that could potentially even further increase the speed advantage that we see from Koopman training. Uh, one of those is parallelization. Koopman training is even more amenable to parallelization than many standard optimizers because it involves a lot of um, non-sequential matrix operations. So that's something that could definitely be further explored uh, and could definitely you know, strengthen our speed advantage. And then the uh, another thing that is um, worth exploring in the future is that there are various different methods of computing the pseudo inverse that are faster than the ones that we use. So for instance, um, uh, there was a recent paper that found that using the Cholesky method, uh, which is a fast way of computing pseudo inverse could greatly reduce the cost of um, various Koopman algorithms. And it's something that we would uh, definitely like to explore more in the future of. The dominant cost of finite section based Koopman training is the pseudo inverse calculation. This will probably also remain true if other methods from KOT were used. Any method that can lower such costs will lead to an automatic optimization acceleration. A way to manage the pseudo inverse costs is to split up the node level perspective even further, breaking the node dynamics into smaller levels for further study without an inordinate loss of accuracy. The same principle that guided us from approximations to network Koopman operators to approximations of the node Koopman operators is at play here. Such quasi node look at the dynamics ultimately sits at the compromise between the extreme efficiency of the single weight approach, which looks at each weight's dynamics as independent from the others, and the relative accuracy of the node approach. The computational complexity of using node or any other kind of partitioning technique is relatively dependent only on the size of the partitions used. 
However, there could be other smarter partitions of the weights that could be possible. For example, grouping weights together, not by the nodes they go towards, but by the amount of movement seen by them. With that, I would like to thank all the great people who were instrumental in making this project a success. A special mention to R.V. Joka of New York University, who was our go-to machine learning expert, and Professor Mezik and Kevridikis of UCSB and Johns Hopkins, respectively. We would also like to thank Professor Hamzi of Imperial College London for giving us the opportunity to present this work, alongside the NeurIPS reviewers whose comments were very helpful in expanding the scope of our work. We would also like to thank each and every viewer of this presentation and would be pleased to hear their comments, criticisms, and advice as we plan our future steps in this interesting intersection of dynamical systems and optimization theory, especially when viewed from the context of machine learning.